Hello. Welcome to Gaming After Kids. Thank you for coming on Saturday evening to spend some PAX time with us. We appreciate it. This yeah. Oh, <laughs> babysitters. Yes. We, that, I'm sure, will be a recurring theme this evening. Uh, before we get started, I briefly want to offer a land acknowledgement for the space we're on. We are residing on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Massachusetts people, whose name was appropriated by this commonwealth. We pay respect to the Massachusetts elders, past and present. We acknowledge the truth of violence perpetrated in the name of this country, and we make a commitment to uncovering that truth. Thank you. So we are here today to talk about gaming after kids, which in hindsight probably should have been called gaming during kids. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, I mean, if it's, if it's going to last several decades, then it's not really, we can't wait till after. We have to figure out something in the meantime. Uh, this is, I've moderated several panels uh, at Women in Games Boston, which is a local group that meets every month that you should totally check out. And we've often discussed at those panels that I've moderated about how to raise the next generation of gamers. And if you're a developer, what role do your kids play in the development process, like as beta testers, for example? And those are all very important and worthy topics. I want to shift the focus a little bit tonight to talk a little bit less about the kids and more about the parents, because, you know, we were here first. And, and, and we deserve some love and some self-care, too. So I've, I've assembled a wonderful panel of, of panelists and parents, parent panelists, that I would like to introduce you to now, starting uh, going down this way, so from your left to the right, with Nick Tompkins-Hughes. And we have family photos that we're sharing. Uh, Nick, would you like to you know, take maybe 30 to 60 seconds telling us about yourself and your family? There's a timer here, too, so I can actually keep an eye on that. <laughs> um, I'm Nick. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. I'm a social worker and a recovering freelance games journalist. <laughs> um, so um, mainly just kind of figuring out right now, I'm figuring out what I do once I finish my bachelor's program as a non-traditional student, returning back to the world of working for a living and also still having children to take care of all the time. Um, instead of, you know, doing the school work children. So I'm excited to step back to balanced life. <laughs> so Good. It's fun. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for being had. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and next we have Jonathan Holmes, a wonderful freelance writer of such groups as Nintendo Force, Destructoid, A Profound Waste of Time. Oh, wow. And mm -hmm. by the way, when I emailed the editor-in-chief of A Profound Waste of Time to ask him to come on my podcast, he wrote back and said, Ken, I don't do a lot of podcast interviews. But you had Jonathan on your show, so you must be good people. Aww. No, Aww. so thank you, Jonathan. But enough about me. Tell us about you. Oh, sure. You've you've already done my job for me. But on top of that, I also work as a social worker during the day, and I'm just meeting Nick <laughs> for the first time. And I don't think this will be the last time I'll be talking oh, to no. Nick today. I'm so, so. excited. <laughs> I had no idea when I put together the senior arrangement that that was true. <laughs> so. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, and next we have Dwayne DeFore, whom I met when we both worked at MIT Medical. And you were on a panel that we did together six years ago about feminism and gaming. And back then, you had zero children. And that's no longer true. <laughs> yeah, I got two kids now. Um, you can see them there. That's my family. Um, yeah, I am a, well, right now I'm a doctoral student. I'm also an educator. Um, I do talks and all that kind of stuff on violence prevention and gender and all those kinds of issues. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to be on another panel with Ken and uh, all these folks. Great. Thank you. Next to you, we have Johanna Shaw, whom I have known for about 22 years. We are former classmates, former coworkers, former curlers. Mm -hmm. And I'm still a curler. You are still a curler. <laughs> I, I have stepped off the ice. But uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, so I, I, cur I curl, as we covered, um, <laughs> which is like the most important thing ever. Um, I mean, the kids are. Uh, so those are my three boys up there. Uh, their picture's a couple years old. They're currently six, seven, and nine. Um, I also have a husband. He matters less. Um, <laughs> I used to, in a past life, work in um, nonprofit fundraising. Then I stopped that, had kids, and now I am going back to school studying nutrition. And you know, then I play games and do other fun stuff around that when I can. 
Very good. Thank you, Joe. And last but definitely not least, we have Jeff Warmoth, who is a professor at Fitchburg State University in the same town where I went to high school, so my old oh. stomping grounds. I did not know that. Cool. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Jeff. Yep, that kind of covers it. So I've been at Fitchburg State for yeah, 20, 20 some years. So I've, I have alumni in the in the in the in the room here, which is cool, um, who have gone on to do bigger, bigger and cooler things. Uh, two kids, uh, Alex and Ben, and Alex is in the audience, my my thirteen year old. So um, I don't know if that means. <laughs> so I don't know if that means I should watch what I say or just lay it all bare. <laughs> and what is it you teach at Fitchburg State? Oh, so I teach game design. Ah. Oh. And you, have you been doing that for 22 years? No. So I, t I, I, I started teaching film and video and interactive media, and eight years ago I had the opportunity to, with a colleague to, uh, to create the game design program. So the, the first in a public institution in uh, New England. Thank you. Uh, and finally, me and my family, I am child-free by choice. <laughs> uh, newsflash, guys, reproductive health is not solely the woman's responsibility. So if you're done having kids, get off your ass and do something about it. <laughs> and so I'm up here not as a parent, but as somebody who is endlessly fascinated by parents and the decisions you have made. I mean, I have so many questions. I mean, I really do admire parents and what they do. It is a difficult path they have chosen. It is not the path I have chosen. Uh, for example, I, I, I just really do want to understand better. Sometimes I need to work on how I respond to parents. Like when they announce they're pregnant with their first child. Oh, that's wonderful. I know this is something you've wanted for a long time. I'm so happy for you. And I'm totally sincere when I say that. And I'm equally sincere when they announce their second child. Good God, why would you do that to yourself again? <laughs> I mean, and one of the reasons I've chosen not to have children is because I have so many activities that I do. People ask me, when do you sleep? I have a full-time day job. By night, I'm on the faculty at Emerson College here in Boston. I host two podcasts and a YouTube channel, and I publish a quarterly magazine. I go contra dancing. I will cycle 100 miles at a time just to chill. And I don't know where I would fit children into that. Obviously, something would have to give, and I would prefer to not give anything. So I have some questions for panelists up here about how they navigate that and how they take care of themselves. There will be time for Q&A at the end, but if you have questions during the panel, please tweet with the hashtag PaxParents, which is in the lower right of the slide on the screen, in case you forget, and we'll be monitoring that stream live during the panel. Mm -hmm. But let's go ahead and start uh, with Nick here. Before you had kids, briefly, what was your relationship with gaming? Like, were you like going hardcore into JRPGs 80 hours a week, or were you playing like mobile games like Angry Birds a few minutes at the supermarket checkout line? What was your relationship with gaming? Uh, first, I, uh, I want to say as a single parent, thank you for being so intentional as you always have been about broadcasting your feelings about your own life preferences. Because as a, as a I mean, I don't know if anybody else up here is someone who has re-entered the dating world as a single parent, a lot of people don't know they don't actually want kids. Mm -hmm. so thank you. <laughs> like genuinely from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Well, uh, <laughs> that is something that was not always obvious to me and several partners and I had to figure that out together. And that was a difficult decision for both of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now that I know, I don't want to put anybody through that again. Yeah, mm -hmm. so thank you. Um, uh, but so to answer your question, um, it has evolved pretty significantly. Um, in high school and when I was younger than high school even, I was more of a marathoner. I would play for like overnight and I fell asleep once sitting up playing Kingdom Hearts and then woke up several hours later and had no idea how much time had passed and just kept playing. Um, <laughs> I fell asleep during a save cycle. I mean, that happens. Um, so, uh, but now as a result of my lifestyle and money is a factor uh, more than it was when I was a kid for sure, both in how much time it takes to make it and also how much, I, how very quickly it goes on one individual game. Um, so now I'm more of a, I really love the room that, or those, like those kinds of games that I Not can, the Tommy was so movie. Well, that also, <laughs> but not, not as a game, preferably no. <laughs> um, but the game with the puzzles and the, yeah, those are great. Um, that's like an easy, I can pick it up for a few minutes. It's a really good stress reliever, but I'm also really excited for the new Animal Crossing. <laughs> so. Oh, who's not? I just right? made it. Yes. I'll have to tell you, Nick. We have a lot to talk about. Yeah, we do. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, so that's kind of a really 
a snapshot of my evolution. Cool. Let's skip over to Joe with that same question. You are, I, I would say, primarily a board gamer. Is that true? Oh, yeah. And so I assumed that once you had kids, the board games would go on the shelves and you'd be stuck playing Candyland as opposed to Betrayal at House on the Hill and the like. What, what, were, what was your gaming habit like before kids? Uh, well, I'm Joe, and I'm a board game addict. Um, I have a board game room in my house. Last time I counted, which was a long time ago, there was over 200 games, um, like board and card games. <laughs> um, so yeah, I played almost anything like anybody would put in front of me. I still will, given the chance. Um, we yeah, we used to play things like Betrayal at House on the Hill. I assume you mentioned that because you probably played it at my house. Mm -hmm. um, but now I get stuck playing Candyland. Um, I do call that stuck. Uh, I've tried, we've tried really hard to get our kids graduated from the kid games as early as possible. So like now even my six-year-old is beating us at Settlers of Catan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that one's scary smart. Um, so yeah, we've kind of just taken the approach of like, we're gonna keep playing the games we can as long as they have the ability at all to comprehend them. And as soon as he can master reading, we're gonna have so many games we can play. Uh, Jonathan, you shared some details via, with us via email lately about how you're more intentional in your game choice since becoming a parent. Is that correct? Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah. So what kind of games did you used to play versus what you play now? Uh, I would play games that terrified me and disempowered me because it was uh, a way to try to get through my own fear and disempowerment. So, so like Silent Hill? Silent Hill, Resident Evil, games by, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name, not Insomniac. Uh, they made Soma and, yeah, Frictional, thank you. Oh, look at this guy. Uh, <laughs> and that's not going to fly. My, my son got terrified of watching Samurai Jack when uh, oh. Samurai Jack's dad got an arrow in his shoulder. Spoiler. Is he going to be okay? It was like two weeks of that, and I, I didn't remember it being a scary show. So <laughs> he's very sensitive. Uh, he'll, if I take a nap and he doesn't know where I am, he'll cry. Like, I thought you were with me, you know, the, doing some object relation stuff, seeing that I'm missing. So, but he loves playing video games every morning at 620. He starts tapping on my face and saying, is it time for the bar? Which is what he calls a 3DS. Nobody knows why. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he wants to play Kirby, Yoshi, and, and Mario. Wow. Yeah. Now, Dwayne, we had a coworker once who told me that he would play about 20 hours of games a week. He would put the kids to bed and just stay up till midnight playing games. He played more games as a parent than I do as someone who's child-free by choice. I don't get it. Has your amount of gaming changed since having a kid? Or kids? Uh, yeah, I would say it's definitely changed. Um, you know, similarly, when I was younger, I would do like all-night sessions. I was always more of a sports gamer. Uh, you know, NBA 2K. Well, I'm back when I was you know, really hardcore gaming. It was my friends and I would do like Tecmo Bowl tournaments, uh, Mad 93 on Sega. I almost failed out of college thanks to that. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I would play other games as palate cleansers, but I was mostly a sports gamer. Um, and yeah, we would, friends and I, we'd do like all night tournaments, all week tournaments mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, now it's it's definitely shifted and, you know, I have two kids and with each one, you know, the the time to play has, has shifted a little bit more. My my first son, you know, one thing when, when they're babies, you can, you know, just hold them while they sleep and play. And then they start moving around, and it's like, damn it, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, but then I have another baby who gave me that opportunity again um, while, was, while the mother watches the older one. Um, but, you know, it, it I definitely do my gaming now at night after the kids are asleep. Um, and I didn't used to fall asleep play, playing games, but there are many nights where I wake up with a controller in my hand <laughs> at like 2 a.m. and realize I got to, when the baby's screaming, I got to go to bed. Uh -huh. Can you estimate how many hours you spend playing games nowadays? Like, per week? One. <laughs> <laughs> it really fluctuates because, I mean, I'm, I'm busy with a lot of other things too. So um, I, these days, if I get like an hour or two in in the evening, I feel pretty good. Um, so, you know, maybe five to ten hours a week at this point. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. But again, that's all like late at night when everyone's in bed. Mm -hmm. Now, Jeff, you are someone who has games as part of your professional life, which may not be true for the rest of us. Yeah. So does that mean you have a lot of time for games? 
no, it doesn't. <laughs> Which is in, yeah, it's interesting. And I and um, just you know, in terms of my my relationship with gaming, I, I it's it's fluctuated quite a bit from like you know in high school I was a big um, D and D player. You know, junior high and high school big D and D player. Um, Ultima, I can date myself, but like one, two, and three back. Right. Nice uh, Ultima Exodus. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yep. uh, Apple Two E uh, in the in the den. Um, and uh, but then I went you know, probably all of undergraduate without really playing video games or tabletop games at all. So I could go like big, big chunks of, you know, years, years at a time and then kind of jump back into it. So, so I don't have a, um, a relationship with gaming where like, oh, I have to be playing games, you know, all, all the time. So it's interesting that, um, uh, but you know, Diablo and, and, and uh, World of Warcraft, you know, in the, in the, 90s um, console games um, like Fallout 3 and Skyrim. Uh, how does this, uh, you know? And I, I, like, I, I try to play a little bit of a lot of games, right? As a as a game professional, if I can. Um, but certainly, and I think we probably jump into this content a bit later. But um, you know, have, having um, I, I love this uh, this idea, Dwayne, of like you know when the when the kids were babies, you could kind of play anything. Like mm -hmm. I'm gonna go, you know, and when I think when Alex was uh, you know six months old, like sure I'll go into Fallout and you know mm -hmm. and and attack the zombies in in the sewers. But you know at some point he's you know they start getting scared of that stuff. Mm -hmm. so. Now, Jonathan, it's important to you that you play games because besides being a social worker, as we discussed, you are a writer for all of these mm -hmm. uh, different outlets. So how do you feel when you don't have time to play games? Oh, I, I would get fired. <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, I have to make time. So yeah. But, whether... but it's not just a professional obligation for you. I mean, you, you pursue the freelancing because you love it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, the, my day job pays 50 times more than my, my working on video games for fun. Mm. You know, uh, I wouldn't keep playing it. Could, wouldn't keep playing games and writing about it if, I, if it wasn't a passion. Because then the writing would be bad, and uh, I would have a bad time too. So it would be lose lose for everybody. But yeah, it. Uh, I try to pick games that I can play alongside my son. There's a lot of games I just turn down for review mm -hmm. these days. Uh, one of the last games I reviewed, Super Crush KO, which mm -hmm. is a game about a woman whose cat is stolen by an alien who loves cats. So she needs to go into the city and beat up robots to get her cat back. Her cat's name is Chubbs. It's a very good game, and my son liked it. It's very combo heavy, but button mashy at the same time. He had a good time with that. What else did I review? I uh, Shovel Knight, King of Cards. Mm -hmm. My son knows all the Shovel Knight characters and is learning about relationships and character design through them. I'm saying, how does this character make you feel? He makes me feel fat. Oh, that's because he's big and he's heavy. So that's interesting, isn't it? Wouldn't it be fun to be fat? Yeah, I'm going to be fat someday. That's great. I'm trying to do a lot of body positivity things. How does this character make you feel? So we, we talk through it. And then that also informs my reviews. I, I will mention, like, I wouldn't have liked this game as much if I didn't have it almost be social lubricant for something for me and my four-year-old to, to bond over. So if you're a parent, you know, think about this game in a different way. Nick, when do you find time to play games? I'm like, are the kids always with you? Um, I'm very, very fortunate that my co-parenting trio that we have has a really good schedule that works for us. Um, so I get two nights kind of off, um, which I say off because I usually use them to work for the majority of what would have been time that I would have been awake. Um, but that does give me a little bit more freedom sometimes to be able to like sit for an hour and you know, look for new mobile games or, you know, follow Aline and see what she's playing these days. Um, and so I kind of the same thing, like late at night when everybody's asleep. Um, also in waiting rooms, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. I get to do a lot of gaming in waiting rooms for doctor's offices. Um, mm -hmm. But kind of similar to what Joey said, um, we really have focused on playing games together or like if my 10-year-old or 9-year-old rather is 10-year-old, oh my God, he's 10. My 10-year-old um, <laughs> is playing something, you know, on the laptop and is using headphones, and then the four-year-old wants to do something that I don't need to be a part of, uh, then that's a moment that I might grab the switch and see, like, you know, can I jump into something that I was enjoying a while ago, or is there something new that some of either, any of them have downloaded that I could just jump into and check out? Um, mm -hmm. So it's really just grabbing time when I can, uh, but I am getting to a point now that they're a little bit older where I'm 
starting to kind of say like, I'm going to do this for like an hour and I'll be back. You know, like I'll be in the basement for an hour or I'll be upstairs for an hour and you guys are good, right? You're good. You just, I'll be upstairs, you know? <laughs> um, so I'm excited for, there's a couple games coming out in the next year or so that I'm hoping to maybe try that on <laughs> and see how it goes. And for myself as well, like can I stick to, if I say I'm going to play Animal Crossing for an hour, can I stick to it? And mm. should like A, model that, hold myself accountable. Do I want to put myself through that yet? Not sure if I do. Um, is it easier to say, I'm just not going to buy it? Um, so that's, that's a big thing for me, is balancing it out. Yeah, knowing yourself and your <clears throat> limits can be very important, which is why I have not picked up any Civilization games in the last 20 years. <laughs> because I am missing entire days of my college career. I don't know where they went, but I, I'm pretty sure I lost those games anyway. So, All right, and Did any of you think, before you had kids, if I have children, I'm going to have to stop playing games. Did any of you think like that time is just not going to be available to me anymore? I'm going to say no, but I also didn't realize until, you know, not an embarrassingly recent amount of time that I really am not super interested in having kids. <laughs> it's a little late. <laughs> it's a little late in the game <laughs> to make that life choice. Um, if I had had a little bit more, I don't know, actual age-appropriate lived experience as a youth, maybe I would have been more aware of the fact that I didn't really want to sign myself up to a lifetime of parenting. Uh, but here we are. <laughs> you do know that this is being recorded. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it is someday what it is. be heard by your children. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I feel like there's a difference between, and that, I mean, like, just because you brought it up. So I feel like it's okay, for, in my opinion, I feel very strongly that it's okay for my, my kids to know that I would not necessarily have chosen this for myself if I had had more opportunities mm. and process and, uh, you know, opportunity models of what my life could have been outside of having two kids at, or, you know, my first kid at 20, 22, um, which was the model that was available to me. And it was the only thing I knew and expected. And actually a really funny story, just because we're on it, uh, my kids actually pointed out to me the other day recently that it didn't seem like a lot of fun that after they go to bed, then I have to do my homework and clean up the house and then I can do what I want to do. And I was like, yeah, you know, honestly, not that fun. And they're like, is that what happens when you have kids and you're a mom? And I'm like, yes, it is. And I was like, do you guys think that you want to have kids? And then in unison, they both said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, then I guess I, if, if that's what you want to do. But when I was their age, it was, when are you having kids? It wasn't, mm. okay, it's fine. You don't oh. have to have kids. You know what I mean? Like the, Such a good point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there wasn't a process model for that. Such empathetic kids though. They're like able to put their sons in your shoes and be like, I don't want to be in those shoes. Yeah. No, Blessing and a curse sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, and I'm, I'm kind of glad that you mentioned that because it is, it's, part of what we're talking about, like that modeling and being self-aware and also showing that it's okay to be a gamer and balance that mm. life responsibility. It's not one or the other. It's not you have to give it up completely. It's not you have to only do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah. Dwayne, I saw you shaking your head when I asked that question about, did you think you had to have to give up gaming? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think at one point, I did when I was younger, but I also had the benefit. My brother has kids, um, and he had kids before I did, um, and so I got to see how he interacts with, you know, his. He has daughters, um, his daughters, and video games, and um, you know, I got to see the, the, you know, the games he played change, the hours he he played change too. But for me too, I was really interested in. One of the things that I'm excited about, my kids are young now, they're all they're both under three, so they're not really playing much. I can get my my oldest son to play um like excite bike and that kind of stuff, but um I can't get him to do anything you know too intense yet. Uh, I'm excited for when we can start playing games together. Um, you know, I see my brother doing that with his girls and and uh, w you know when you talked about we, we were talking a little bit earlier about the evol evolution of how we played games throughout our own lives. Um, you know, I think for me, when I was younger, the way I got into video gaming was, was really a social experience. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, it became more of a solitary experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, I'm not able to get together with friends as much. My brother lives in another state. We would play online um, a lot. Um, but, you know, hours don't always match. So I would end up playing games with myself a lot. And so I'm really excited for the opportunity my son to get older and then I can start playing games with him and it can become a bit more of a social experience for me again. Mm. If you, do you have a 3DS? 
<laughs> no, I'll, I'll let you borrow mine. I have a Switch, though. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So many free demos. And uh, yeah. just, just to quickly spit this out, free demos are a godsend mm-hmm. to play games with your kid mm-hmm. because they all have a natural ending yeah, point. Yeah. So if he's like, I want to play for three hours, I'm like, that demo ends in ten minutes after <laughs> we beat up this tree. Why do we beat up trees, Dad? Because it makes them cry. Why do we want trees to cry? I'm not sure. Do you want to make trees cry? And then we turn on the conversation. Anyway, uh, yeah, free, free demos are, are great. And he's he started getting good at Kirby Planet Robobot. Anyone play that one, 3DS? He got good at that at like two and a half. It's really? amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so I can go. I like to talk. Now, it's great that you're playing games with your kids. I met one parent who said, I didn't have a kid. I had a player, too. Aww. Like he didn't, he didn't have anybody to play with, so he made one. <laughs> <laughs> great. Guys, if you don't want kids, please don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> please, please don't there are better and worse that. reasons to have kids. Yes. I'll let you evaluate whether that is a better or a worse one. Yeah. So fair. So, Joe, when you mostly play board games, which is not really something you can do on your own. And so you need to carve out time to have friends over and play games with them. And are the kids present when you're having those board game parties, or do you wait till they go to bed? Um, we haven't had one in a really long time because, like, I've school. noticed. <laughs> no, I just cut you out of the invitation list. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, um, <wow. laughs> That's what you get for leaving us. <laughs> yeah, seriously, you're not around anymore. Um, no, we haven't had one in a long time, mostly because. We can't find time to even talk to each other enough to figure out a date on the calendar to schedule a game day. Uh, and we keep saying, oh, yeah, we'll do it on that day. And then we can't get our act together to actually invite people until we're like, oh, that's like three days away. I guess that's not happening. Um, we used to have these epic game days where we would invite people over, like open-ended, come over starting at 2 in the afternoon. We're going to start playing games. We would sometimes have three or four games going at once because we had that many people over. And it would go sometimes till 2 in the morning, ending in crazy, super competitive, I'm not giving up till I'm the one who wins, rounds of Wii Bowling and crazy, <laughs> drunken renditions in Karaoke Revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, those nights don't happen anymore. Uh, we have had game days since having the kids. It was easier when they were really little. Because like we would move the extra saucer into the game room. We have a board game room because um, we're dorks in the best way possible. Um, <laughs> we also have a video game room. Uh, so and, and the the decor of that room was the subject of last year's panel that we did. Yep. Because it's all themed after the Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time Forest Temple. Yeah, it is. Whoa. And she did it all herself. No, that's the one thing of painting I actually imported my brother-in-law for. Um, But I did most of it myself, yeah. Uh, So we still do sometimes have game days, but now, like when I was saying, when the oldest one was a baby, we would just pick up the extra saucer and move it in the game room and just plop him in there, and he would keep himself busy, and we could ignore him and play games, which was great. Now they're harder to ignore. so now, But now they're old enough, they play their own games, so we can have a game day and list it as, okay, starting 2 to 6, anybody can come over. Or like 2 to 8, like say, our kids go to bed at 8, get your kids out of my house by 8, so my kids will go to bed and we can play adult games. Um, so sometimes we do it that way and like incorporate them playing their own stuff during the day and then get them the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> Jeff, when you find time to play your own video games, do you feel any sort of guilt, like... I, I should be spending time being a dad or I should be playing these games with my kids and like this is very selfish and self indul- self-indulgent of me. Do you ever have that guilt? So lately I've, I've just been trying to play games that either either with the kids or that um, are like kind of the kids would would enjoy being spectators of, right? So, I, so I've tended to try to do that so it probably has kind of shifted my my, my taste in games or, or the kind of selection of games that, that, I'll, that I'll choose. And so then that gets to be interesting because I'll, I'll carve out some time to play, but it won't necessarily have to be after everyone's gone to bed. I could play a game in the living room and go like, all right, my PS4 now. <laughs> um, y'all can watch, though, if you want. Um, right, and then that, that, that actually brings the, um, the social aspect back in, even if it's solitary gaming to, to some extent. Obviously, there's some genres that that doesn't really work for, but I've never been a big like horror game player, and that's probably the, the obvious genre that like that wouldn't work well with um, you know for kids. I've never been a huge like FPS you know um, sh- uh, player either. Um, so 
so I, I think it, it kind of it kind of works. Although, like I said, there's, I'm sure that there's there have been some shifts where I, where I'm not playing you know particularly violent or bloody games because that just doesn't you know in the same way that you you're careful about what films you watch while your kids are awake versus <coughs> versus asleep. Sure. Does anybody on this panel experience guilt associated with your gaming? Mm, yes, I. He, I think I mentioned he wakes me up at like 6.20 in the morning to play 3DS. And I know the responsible parent would say, let's have breakfast first. Let's, <laughs> but I also want to play 3DS. So I'm like, great minds. Okay, we can do like three levels of Mario. And I'm like, th th I'm not teaching him to use gaming as a reward. I'm, it, it's like the first thing he wants to do. But he's so playful and so experimental. And I know he's right. learning through the games. Like he's learning to read different words because he's associating reading with having fun with games. So we learned the word, how to spell new, wow, uh, no, not, not the biggest yes and no he's learned. And that's through like the menus and stuff like that. So, so there's internal conflict for sure. And uh, it's gonna be interesting to try to work it out. But for now, uh, 15 minutes of video games before the sun comes up doesn't seem to be doing too much harm. So okay. he's doing okay. Good. I don't think you should feel guilty about teaching your son or your children new words. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You have my seal of approval. Whatever that's worth. Um, I definitely experience the guilt, but I experience the guilt to, and I don't know how many of us on the on the panel would identify as the primary parent in the household, um, but for me as the primary parent, I feel guilty when I take too long in the bathroom because mm. there's so much stuff that needs to be done and mm -hmm. people need me and I, you know, I sit down to watch a show while I'm doing my homework and everyone else is busy and I'm like, I should be folding laundry while I do this, you know? <laughs> like, I should be folding laundry and doing my homework and watching a show because that's how I earn watching a show. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But when I do have game time, actually, it almost becomes one of the only things that I don't feel guilty about. <laughs> I don't know how that has worked out, but I've managed to kind of define it as like, uh, this is my time. I'm gonna, you know, play on. I'm gonna play a new iPad game, or I'm gonna, you know, open up my 3DS and play an old game for a long time. Um, and because I'm actually getting to a point with them, they're 10 and 4, um, where they want to play games, even if it's not together, they're fine with us playing our own separate games in the same space, which mm -hmm. I do with grown-ups mm -hmm. on the reg. So I'm fine with teaching them that that's okay to be a lot, you know, around each other, but we do use it as more of a motivating tool. Mm -hmm. um, like our household is more of like, once you've, you've gotten dressed and you've eaten your Cheerios and you've put your bowl away, yeah, whatever, do what you want, get, mm -hmm. you know, you're good. Mm -hmm. um, but so I think it's kind of weird that I've managed to separate them and it's like the only thing I don't feel guilty about. That's great though, <laughs> to give yourself permission. When, okay. when you were talking before about how you are commending Ken for being clear about the decision he made to not have kids. I've advised so many people to not have kids. Uh, the first thing I ask them is, are you ready to be an extra in the story of your own life? Like not even a supporting character. Like, are you bored enough with yourself that you're ready to put someone else in the starring role and have everything revolve around them? And I, I got to that point, luckily for me. So I'm excited to just kind of forget about myself uh, most of the time. I know. And there's a cute baby that someone oh. just tweeted that just popped up in the feed as questions. So like, <laughs> thank you for the sure. cute baby. But so, sorry, I apologize. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. So we've been talking about our individual gaming habits. Uh, how many of you share your gaming habit with your partner, if any? And if not, does your partner support slash understand this habit? Uh, Dwayne? Um, actually, just really quick. Similarly, Gaming is the one thing that I probably don't feel guilty about too, mm. because I'm I I do it after I've done everything else that I'm going to do that day after I've cleaned and the kids are in bed and everything. So so you're using it as a reward. Time. Yeah, yeah. You're, I actually you're almost feel guilty when I don't game. Like if I'm like, oh, there's a show on Netflix, but I got this game. Because I also I use GameFly, so I uh, free advertising. Sorry, but uh, I rent my games. And so then I'm also like, I have a financial reward to like, I got to play this, send it back, get another one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can also get free games from your pop-up library. Uh -huh. Libraries carry video games. Movies, video games. Mm -hmm. And movies and Blu-rays and PS4, Switch, everything. And if they don't have it, they can get it for you through interlibrary loan. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get it through interlibrary loan, ask them if they're open to creating a video game library because there are grants available for public libraries that are open to multimedia displays. Awesome. Thank you. Side note. There you go. Oh, very good. <laughs> I so, that too, but um, sorry, what was the 
<laughs> Do you have a partner who either games with you no. or supports your gaming? No. No. <laughs> I wish. I, I try and get her to play. I'll get her to play. Um, I got her to play like a Grand Theft Auto for a while, and she just <laughs> we, we would go online, and she would just run people over, and I was like. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll get her to play, you know, on Switch, like, uh, you know, some of the, uh, I just got that Ring Fit, oh, she'll play that sometime, like, yeah, I'll get her to play a little bit, and then she's like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about you, Joe? Um, my husband plays games, well, video games definitely more than I do, um, and he plays them with the kids. Like, I've come home from the grocery store and found them all sitting on the couch, like the boys all watching him playing like Breath of the Wild or something like that. That's um, tender. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, like all the Lego games too, they're all kid friendly, which are nice. Um, I also highly recommend if you have kids, if you're already at that point, uh, Lego City Undercover is awesome for mm -hmm. kids. There's problem solving involved and like minimal violence and like the, the kids I have loved it. I just got it for free on Wii U. Nice. They're giving There's them also away. a train. If you've got a kid who's into trains. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the trains. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time watching my kids just drive the train around the city. Um, right, the question. Oh, Matt. Um, right, so he play, enjoys board games just as much as I do, um, which is good and bad, because like, we'll encourage each other to like find new ones, and then we don't stop each other when we want to buy new ones that we don't have time to play. Um, hence that giant collection, <laughs> some of which is still in plastic. Um, but yeah, we will, after we put the kids to bed, sometimes go play games. And like, as you had mentioned before, somebody had said that, you know, their kid was player too. Like we've been anxiously awaiting and the kids are finally getting old enough for some of the good games so that now we can play some of the ones that require more than two people because we can't always get our, you know, what together to invite people over. So like now we can play Settlers of Catan or as my six-year-old calls it, Catan Jr., the grown-up version. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it's nice that he enjoys the games too, because uh, we can enable each other. And actually, that's like the one time we usually find time to do something together that's not parenting. And what about you, Jonathan? Your partner? Oh yeah, no, she hates video games. Uh, but she just this morning said to me, um, "Co-parenting with me uh, has taught her to hate them less, which is nice." <laughs> so <laughs> we're heading in the right direction. She was brought up with very strict parents who just said video games and cartoons are a waste of time. You should always be reading a book. And I'm constantly saying, like, mm -hmm. they didn't have video games 100 years ago. If they did, your parents would be saying, like, why aren't you playing Mario right now? Because you learn problem solving. You learn to anticipate things to be afraid of and how to get through that fear. You learn to deal with loss. You learn hand-eye coordination. You learn to read. You learn about relationships. Like, he's not, he's learning some of that from Frog and Toad, but not quite all of that. So mm -hmm. I think video games have their place, and she's coming around to that. But she was taught that they're, like, taboo. I was brought up with a mom who was herself brought up in a religious commune where they ate chocolate once a year, and that was, like, their party. The rest of the time they were just eating gruel and being uh, miserable. What's that? Carob. Yeah, carob, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know about that. So she's a big rebel. She brought me up on Atari 50. Uh, 200 and breakout and we used to play that all together and have it be a bonding time a, a problem solving time a discussion time so I have that ingrained in me so I was always ready to play video games with my kid I always thought it would be good so far so good I hope. yeah and what about you Jeff that's great um, man how do I follow that that's beautiful oh, that's <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, no but yeah actually my wife does uh, does game and um, and there, there's stuff that we'll play together or that, you know, I, I'll come home and she's playing Diablo 3 with both kids and they're in co-op and, you know, um, going around slaying things. And um, so, so yeah, we, I probably game more than she does with the kids, but, um, but she definitely either plays solo or, or, or plays stuff with the kids or with the four of us. So. Awesome. That question came from Jerry on the Twitter feed, so thank you. Cool. Can I Thanks, answer Jerry. even though I don't have a partner right now? Go for it. I mean, like, I don't have a, I don't have a, a live-in, I don't have a nesting partner. I don't have a live-in parenting partner. Um, but I have co-parent partners, and then I've also had significant relationships with people who are gamers. 
I have not enjoyed that dynamic, mm. honestly. Mm-hmm. It's really, really, really hard when you have to have a discussion about who's going to do the cat box and the dishes and the laundry and also who has earned the right to spend an hour doing nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it's just not an easy conversation to have, ever. Mm-hmm. Um, and But I think that the fun thing that I've found is that transitioning to tabletop games has kind of made that less hard. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, either with like new partners that I'm seeing who get to the meet the kids stage, which doesn't happen very often, um, or you know, with, with people who are past partners that have transitioned to more of like a now we're friends and you're just like a friend of the family role. Um, tabletop gaming has been the key to that in making it balanced and functional and like using that as if you want to play games and I want to play games, then let's figure out something that we can play together. Um, and Chariot was my first attempt at that. I love mm. Chariot. It's like a co just plugging Chariot. It's a good time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like a little co-op game. So. Cool. So, Nick, I want to summarize an anecdote you shared with me on our podcast, which was that your kiddo at school had to fill out a survey about, like, this is how well I know my mom. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions was, what does your mom like to do for fun? And your kiddo wrote, uh, my mom likes to cook me food. Dinner. (laughs) Dinner. My my mom likes to make me dinner. That's her fun time. And, you know, that that represents a fundamental misunderstanding of your identity. Uh, it sure does. <laughs> I mean, so since so since you brought that up, I want to give the other panelists the opportunity to ask or to answer. Do your kids see gaming as something that is important either to you as a person or to your household? Or is it just like this funny little thing that we sometimes do? Mm. So, uh, I can, Jonathan? I can jump into that. Yeah. Sure. So... I don't feel guilty about playing video games. I do feel guilty about coming to PAX and then writing about video games that I just played. I just interviewed Hideki Kamiya, who created uh, Bayonetta and mm-hmm. the Wonderful 101. But that interview is going to take me probably like four hours to transcribe and like write out and do narrative around. So that's where my guilt comes in. And all weekend, my son has been saying, hey, dad, are you a video game man? <laughs> I guess so. What does that mean? He's like, can you be my video game? I'm like, not really. But he knows that because video games are priority to me, I have to like be away. I've only seen him for like two hours today. And my wife not liking video games, she's not psyched to bring him here really. So it's there's been some friction there. And I'm hoping to start introducing him to writing and drawing about the, uh, video games. Who here likes Castlevania? Anyone here? Okay. See me after the panel. I have a comic book for you. I, I, I made a Castlevania comedy comic strip for uh, a magazine called Nintendo Force. And my son and I drew a comic book. There's a few up front if you want to get one. So I'm trying to integrate him into it as a way to be creative and be productive and to get to know himself and others. But when I'm just sitting in front of a computer typing, it, it doesn't look like that's what I'm doing. It just looks like I'm ignoring him. And that's, that's really where the guilt comes in. What about you, Jeff, since gaming is, you know, where you spend most of your time? I mean, not playing games, but games are an integral part of your career. So they must understand that this is not just a silly little pastime. This is something that's important. Yeah, yeah. No, they definitely, they definitely get it. And I would say that probably for, for my, uh, for my kids, they have an impression that games are maybe even more important to me than they actually are to me, which is an interesting, (laughs) right? Right. They, Right, because they do know that I teach game design, and so then, like, kind of every nuance of any game that they're playing, they're like, "Oh, Dad needs to hear this in every detail because he's a, he teaches game design, so he mm-hmm. needs to know that like this is the this is the way to you know sneak into this thing, or we might, or or let me tell you about every attribute of every character in the mm-hmm. you know." Mm-hmm. Um, but it's cool, it's endearing, and it's also it's it's great um, because we you know it gives us like some common ground to to talk about that obviously kids, whether gaming was important to me or not, kids, it's important to them, Mm -hmm. right? And so it gives us, gives us some common, common ground. Um, We had a a really fun moment uh, a couple weeks ago when um, I, uh, I was kind of perusing our, we have a library and game lounge at at, um, Fitchburg State. And I was like, oh, there's this Game Boy. Um, And, and Alex had been playing um, uh, uh, had been playing uh, like Metroid 2 um, on like an emulator on a laptop. And I, 
was like, oh, I got this. And, and, and so I was looking around for cartridges. I didn't, have any, uh, I didn't have any cartridges handy, but I was like, well, let me bring the Game Boy home and I'll test and see if it works later. And then like, that, I was like, I wasn't going to tell them about it until I, I made sure I got a, a cartridge and, was, and things were set up. And like that night he came like at dinner. He's like, Dad, I went into your office and <laughs> I saw that there was a Game Boy there. <laughs> so there's definitely like some, some overlap that people in different uh, other professions wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily have. And it's definitely something that, that comes up. Mm -hmm. Johanna, I recently went over to your house with a big fluffy dog. And like my, I was flipping out of my mind because I love dogs like <laughs> far more than I love kids. And I thought your kids would love this dog, and all they wanted to do was play Smash Brothers with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm guessing games are kind of important to your kids. Yeah, and they still talk about beating you in Smash Brothers. <laughs> oh. I'd never played it before. <laughs> oh, see, I, I assumed you were letting them win, which, is, which, which would have been really sweet. I am not the nice mom who lets my kids win at games. Um, a couple people out here who know me who I'm sure are not surprised by this. Uh, I'm a little competitive. Um, it teaches them real life skills, but uh, <laughs> yeah, they definitely know that gaming is important to us as a family because, as I mentioned, we've made dedicated space for it um, and have a ridiculous amount of games, but we also use it like when we realize, oh, we've been paying attention to like doing the dishes and the laundry and the stuff that has to be done as a parent and letting them entertain themselves like, oh, look, they're entertaining themselves with that one's on a tablet and that one's on the laptop and that one's on the switch. Hey, guys, it's time to shut this off. We're going to have a family game time. And so they know that we use that for balance. Like, hey, here's something we can do together. We're going to stop doing our separate things. We're going to stop looking at screens. This is something that we can all enjoy, even though, like, you guys are slightly different ages and at different abilities. We can find games that all of us can play together. Uh, like, lately, they've been really into playing Bones, where you roll five dice, and depending on what you roll, you add up scores. And it's also known as greed, if you heard it that way, like you can decide to save your score or risk it and so then it gets exciting when you like egg the blonde or roll again when they only have one die left and they're probably going to lose it all. And kids are suckers which makes it fun. <laughs> like I said, a little competitive. Um, but yeah, we've definitely shown them that it's important to us and that it's good for all of us. That like it's something that can bring us together and something that's like you know, you can use your brain and not just stare at a screen. Awesome. Dwayne, do your, are your kids even old enough to appreciate what games are and their value? No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting to hear this because I'm thinking about, you know, I would love my kids to have balance. And um, that's the eternal struggle as a parent is like, how do you mm -hmm. give them balance with things, you know? So mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely something that I'll be considering. But at this point, I don't know that I have to worry about it too much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the first thing you can do, of course, is model balance with yourself. You know, make sure that there's time for games and there's time for other things, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to take care of yourself first. Put on your own oxygen mask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then put one on the kid. <laughs> That's right. Cool. So I want to leave the last 12 minutes for questions, but stay in your seats. And instead of lining up, I'm going to grab that mic and I'm going to walk around to people who have their hands up. Now, a question is a short interrogative statement that ends with a question mark. <laughs> it does not include your life story. It does not include two-part questions. And so if you have a question, please raise your hand. Can I answer one of the online questions while you find the first person real quick? Or like, OK. Hey, guys. This is more of a question, moms versus dads. Have you found it easier as a mom or a dad to kind of keep your gamer identity rather than like moms are supposed to do the momming where dads get to have more fun or in the modern world is that just kind of loosening? Mm. That's a question. really good question. I mean, I, I feel like I'm in an, also in a really weird position too. So I'm, I'm, in the, I'm kind of in the middle. Um, like mm. I, I use the mom label because that's what makes sense for us right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely think that I would say that it has more to do with the primary parent versus the non-primary parent, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, and in my perspective, the primary parent has a much harder time retaining that identity, but that's because the primary parent has a harder time retaining any identity. <laughs> that's a good um, point. If that makes sense. Like, Absolutely. I don't necessarily feel like it has to be one versus the other. It more has to do with the roles of the parents and, and or parents in the household mm -hmm. as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. 
I, don't know. I would say that I'm the default parent. Like, it, it's almost like Matt doesn't exist. Like, the kids will want something, like, when they wake up before us, they'll walk in our room, go around the bed, past him, <laughs> around to me, wake me up and ask, like, he's not there. Uh, but I still do way more fun stuff than my husband. Mm. Um, <laughs> like, I'm here this weekend, and he's home with the kids. Mm -hmm. Sucker. <laughs> uh, like, I make time to go curling, and I'll go away for the weekend to curl. Uh, now, part of that is balance, because he ends up traveling for work for, like, three week stretches at a time. So it's a little bit of balance. Like, you want me to stay sane, or at least as close as I am to start with? Mm -hmm. Like, maybe you should let me out of the house because you just left for a couple weeks, that kind of thing. Um, so I find that I end up doing more fun stuff and he ends up being stuck with his chance to get away from the kids being for work. Um, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> I yeah. will say that the external, I was just thinking about the external pressure from other family members and friends and like people who hear like, oh, you're going to PAX for the weekend? Where are the kids? Mm. I'm sorry, when was the last time you asked their dad that? <laughs> I'm like, just saying, right. <laughs> you know, like okay. that's, that's the only thing that popped into my head when you were saying that, so yeah. sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and since just, you asked uh, a good Sorry, Ken, let me just, um, yeah. if you don't mind adding to that. You know, I think, it you know, the, everyone's house, everyone's family, they run things a little bit different. Um, and I think a lot of times men um, have a, a role that we're sort of taught to take in the family. And I, and I think that as, as men, if you want to be a good parent, then you have to learn to step up and, and do the things that aren't considered the man's role. And, you know, like in, in, in my family, uh, my wife is a slob, and I'm the clean one. So I'm <laughs> always cleaning the house. Um, you know, I'm always cleaning up after her and the kids. And uh, luckily for us, at least right now, and it, it shifts when you have kids, but, like, my oldest son is all about mommy, and the youngest is all about me. So it's kind of, we kind of each have one kid. And I, I hope it at least stays that way, because, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to, it's important to us to not be one of those families where there's super traditional gender roles going on. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, obviously I couldn't best breastfeed and that kind of thing, but I've, mm -hmm. I've been changing diapers since day one and, and bottle feeding and all that kind of stuff. And so to me, it's important that we don't fall into those traditional gender roles. And, and I think any family hopefully considers that as well. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. And since you asked a question, you get to draw one of these cards. And on the back is a steam code. Yay. Uh, now everybody's got questions, huh? <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> by, the, by the way, if it's not too personal, how many people here are parents that they know of? <laughs> yeah. They're aware of. Okay, oh, cool. Quite a few. All right, thank you. Can you have a question? So. <laughs> um, hey, guys, thanks for doing this. <clears throat> uh, a lot of times, like, with I just had a kid, and I don't get to choose who he's friends with. Mm -hmm. um, and they, his parents or their parents de facto become, like, who we hang out with. How do you deal with like gaming being taboo to them? Mm. Mm -hmm. Get new friends. <laughs> <laughs> Get well, your new kids friends. friends. His, I, was yeah, I mean, your your point is is right though. It's that you your friends end up becoming the parents of the kids that your kids are spending time with at school, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's it is important to maintain friendships with people who are actually your friends, mm -hmm. uh, and that does get harder, right? I'll stop there. Uh, I, I, my wife thinks gaming, gaming is taboo, and she's my friend. And I have to kind of make sense. I have to, but thankfully, I practice defending my opinions about video games. It's kind of what a video game journalist has to do: <laughs> is be like, "I think Skyward Sword's one of the best uh, Zelda games." You are an idiot. Oh, okay. Let me explain. <laughs> and uh, so I have some practice validating it, and I think I'm doing okay. But it's it's tough. We are going up against a culture that is taught that video games are junk food, and video games aren't always doing a whole lot to try to counter that opinion. I, I can't count how many free bottles of Red Bull I've gotten just by walking up the street, uh, <laughs> because people are like, oh, you're, you must love junk food if you love video games. That's where it's at in the culture right now. I don't think that's where it's going to be in 20 years, but, but that's what we're dealing with right now. child screen time yeah right. uh-huh like right. that's like oh you're constantly the saying show for half an hour hand-eye coordination hand. problem solving and to dealing with his fears like he'll come up to a hole and be like i'm not jumping over that hole i'm like you have to learn to do this by yourself nope you do it and we'll have an argument about it and eventually he'll jump over it and i'll be like see you can get over your fears he wouldn't have gotten that from frog and toad probably 
<laughs> Maybe. Some yeah. probably. But you're not going to convince your friends of that, unfortunately. It, it gets better, though, as the kids get older, because then they get to start making their own friends through schools and other oh, networks. Sure. And, yeah. you know, I would so say, if too, that if you, so you, your, your kiddo is fairly young? Uh, yes. Uh, one year. Oh, yeah. Mm. So um, in first grade now in my school district, they use a, a website to teach math. So wow. First grade. So the kids that are going into first grade and have never touched a tablet, have never used a computer, are at a disadvantage, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, all of the standardized testing in this state is on computer, and that starts in third grade. Mm -hmm. So if they aren't really comfortable with navigating that, that becomes a deficit and a detriment and a handicap to successful testing amongst peers. Mm -hmm. That right there is a really good argument that shuts down 90% of those conversations. Mm -hmm. Just saying. Wow. Yeah, my kids' elementary school has a cart of Chromebooks that travels mm -hmm. between the classrooms, and they all get time with it and get access to it. And mm -hmm. computer is one of their specialists they have mm -hmm. once a week. Yeah. Cool. No, Thank you. Good here, call. choose a card. <laughs> Just one. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Now we're going to run over here. It's all the running. It's wild. Fast. To you. Hi. Um, so my question is, um, my son is seven. He's autistic. What suggestions do you have for great games that I can play with him that will help him learn some of the skills um, that he needs um, to grow and be social and learn to love games and just, um, but also play with me? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's my question. Do you have any good suggestions for that age range generally? How do you feel about Dungeons and Dragons? I actually <laughs> ordered Critical Core and I am waiting on that Kickstarter to come in and I'm just like anxiously scrolling my Gmail feed constantly for that. So I'm on it. Yeah. Getting there. We, we just started that with, with my uh, 10 year old who has autism and ADHD. Um, it's pretty, pretty significant ADHD. Um, and the Mario Kart, honestly, mm -hmm. is really good. Um, mm -hmm. Like I had a really strong, wonderful moment with him where he beat me for the first time and I was not handicapping myself and I, I almost cried. Um, so that was also a really genuine moment for us to get to have um, that we don't we don't honestly get to have a lot. So, mm. um, but those are the only thing I can think of. Sure, my 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 experience with folks on the spectrum, they've told me like I get afraid I'm just going to get lost in the game and it's going to become like addictive to me. And I think it was last year I did a, a panel on gaming addiction. So I think a lot of it is a, a, also about what games to avoid, games with endless loops, games that are basically playing on the same parts of the brain that are affected by gambling, like mm -hmm. try to keep them away from that. As Pokemon, as a lot of people might know, is co-created by somebody who is on the spectrum. They haven't come out about it. but And because that's the kind of loop that he was hungry for, and it gave him a sense of safety, but it did wall him off from the world. So pro-social games, uh, there's a game called Vitamin Connection that just came out with the, for the Switch that is very co-op heavy, and you need to have interpersonal relationships with a sort of a social lub lubricant for it. So you each person controls the side of a ship. You play as a vitamin who's making somebody better. And uh, it's, yeah, it's a very sweet game. Snipper Clips is similar on the Switch. Yeah. Um, there's a game called Tangle Tower, a point and click game where the, the characters uh, have very expressive uh, facial animations. Mm. And it can teach kids, like, I can get what this person's feeling by how they look and how they sound. And they're they're very vibrant. It's it's actually also made by the Snipper Clips people. So just a few ideas. Can I come up to you after this and get those recommendations Absolutely. again and put them on my phone? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. And one last question. <laughs> How do you deal with a game budget? Mm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> as a kid, as an adult. Yeah. I guess it's true. It's a problem for. Everybody. Start reviewing them. They give them to you for free. <laughs> ask, ask if you can beta test. So that's why. That's why I rent because mm -hmm. I yeah. have a habit of I'll get a game and I never finish it, and it sits on the shelf. And I'm like, I've just paid sixty whatever bucks for this, and you know, so I rent it. I, I don't feel guilty for playing it as long as I end up playing it, and I send it back. And so you can rent them from the library. No budget needed for that. For my boys, what I do is uh, they get an allowance straight to a debit card through this app called Greenlight, which is amazing. And their debit cards are saved on their tablets. So if they want to buy themselves Robux in Roblox or buy themselves a new app that costs a couple dollars, they just have to check if they have money on their debit card. And they don't ask me for money anymore. They know that they, that's their money to spend. Yeah, if you know you're going to buy a game, but then, you know, 
a year later you spend 60 bucks on it and you haven't played it and you're going to feel bad about it wait a year to buy it and then it's on sale <laughs> like every week i get an email from the nintendo eShop, like here are the games that are on sale this week and i just go nuts because i'm like hey this game used to be 30 dollars. now i bought it for three dollars mm -hmm. and even if i don't play it i don't have to feel guilty about it it's okay. gaming without the guilt mm -hmm. i love it mm -hmm. so this has been gaming with before, during, and after kids. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a few more Steam codes to hand out. If you have any questions for us, we'll be available in the hallway afterward. Let's quickly go down the line, starting with Jeff coming to me to remind us where you are and where to find you online. All right, Jeff Wormuth, jeffu.tv or at jeffutv on Twitter. Johanna Shaw, uh, Solstice Joe on Twitter. Dwayne DeFore, Trini DeFore on Twitter. Jonathan Holmes, at non Trotsky on Twitter. It's a long story. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm wait till you hear mine. Uh, I'm Nick Tompkins Hughes. I'm currently on Twitter at, at Sorient Nim. Yeah. And I, sh I, I don't yet know how to figure out what I'm going to do with that. <laughs> and I'm Ken Gagney. I'm on Twitter and YouTube as GameBits. And I also host the podcast Polygamer, which interviews diverse and marginalized voices in the gaming industry. The audio from this panel will be made available on the Polygamer podcast. If you ask one of the questions and you don't want your question on that podcast, please see me afterward. I apologize for not noticing that beforehand. And also the video of the panelists will be on YouTube. So thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of PAX. Thanks, Ken.